Now, if I tell a farmer on Earth that all you need is bare rock and water, they'll tell you there's a little bit more to it than that in terms of actually producing enough food. They may to, also throw something at you. <laughs> that, that, and they would be very right to do so. So we need, there are a number of other issues you have to think about. Um, I mean, one thing, of course, is safety. Well, and this, and this is the sort of issues that NASA's addressed because you actually have to make sure that um, you can create the food, but it's not carrying disease. It's not carrying illness. And, and we do know there are species of food that do this here on Earth. So you don't want to somehow create the conditions that naturally create a viable food source into a potentially poisonous food source. So you want to be very careful about what seeds and soil you take out from Earth so as not to bring any pests with us. Exactly. That being said, if you succeed in doing that, you're not going to have any worry with Martian pests. <laughs> That's true. It's, it's its own natural defender. Stability. Um, how regularly can you create these crops, right? You know, if you're going to be reliant on this as a food source, it needs to be able to know that it's going to grow. The seeds are going to be able to be germinated. It's not great to just have one cycle of plant. You need to be able to grow it create the seeds and survive off of it. That's right. So you need, I mean, you have to have food in winter and in summer. On Earth, with right today, if you, there's a, it's winter and not much is growing here, we can ship in food from somewhere else where it's warmer. You're probably not going to have that option right. early on in Mars. Maybe at some point, a thousand years from now, there might be colonies all over Mars, and that's an option, but that's not going to be the case for a good long while. Exactly. So we have to solve that. Palatability, this is kind of probably an important one. You have to like it. <laughs> yes, I mean, it may be that spinach is the ultimate thing that grows really well and therefore the astronauts are going to have to live off spinach for the next 10 years. I'm not sure I can get many volunteers for that. Exactly. Much as I like spinach, 100% spinach for the rest of my life, maybe not. And, that, and this is going to the important part of nutrition. It's, you know, you need to make sure you have enough things growing. But more importantly, it's not just that you have a variety, it's that they actually have the right nutrition. And this is what they're at least starting to see on the space station that the nutrition of plants grown in the space station is similar to grown here on Earth, but of course that's grown in Earth-like conditions just really probing microgravity. Yes, and it might be that exactly the same plant on Earth will produce a particular breakdown of carbohydrates and protein might do a different one when exposed to less sun and different minerals on Mars. And so evaluating the nutrition is going to be obviously key to that survivability. Uh, limited resources, right? You don't want to grow a very intensive plant. I, you know, I love almonds, but they take an awful lot of water to grow. I don't think we're going to see a lot of almond trees uh, on Mars. And things that require huge amounts of nuclear powered lighting. You, I mean, we, the energy budget is going to be really yes. hard for our space station. We've got a, energy to build our rocket fuel and we're probably going to need it to give enough, let the plants grow. That's right. Uh, variety, as we talked about, you know, you don't want to just eat your spinach uh, every day. And, and that's fair. I mean, you're going to be, again, this is the difference between going into space for 12 days as an astronaut and living there. All of the issues with living there, colonizing in the truest sense, require long-term thinking, not let's just get over the next two weeks. And then, of course, reliability. I mean, let's say something goes wrong. I mean, heaven knows this has occasionally happened on space flight in That's the past. Right. It could be as simple as someone you're flipping the wrong switch and turning the light off or f the heating system failing in your greenhouse and everything gets frozen solid by the next morning. Uh, how do you build a system that's going to be, and then, then do you then starve? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if, if it's do you start year, again and wait three months? Yeah. If it's a year to your next launch window back to Earth and your food's all dead, I mean, uh, it could get very nasty. Exactly. So you're going to want some multiple different modules with redundant systems. You probably want to grow a lot more food than you need. So if something goes wrong, you've got backup. You're going to have to store food. I mean, the, keeping it reliable is going to be pretty important. Exactly. You know, and, and how useful is it, you know, Again, right now they do a lot of prepackaged foods. We're not always going to be the case. So how do you create something that you just is easy to cook, easy to use with? And these sound like simple problems, but again, we're talking about, as you said, with the parallels, you're going to a new continent, a new country. Well, you have to learn everything from scratch. And this is what it's all about. You have to learn everything from scratch here. And it has to work because there is no fallback, as you said. You're not going to be able to go ship in your food quite easily, which is, again, very different from the moon, where if something really went wrong on the moon, you could just go back, right? Yeah. I mean, a number of the early colonies in America and Australia and other places around the world ran out of food. Yes. Several of them, everybody died. Uh, some, several was like the, the first colonies in Australia were saved by a supply ship arriving back from the home country at just the right moment to keep everyone alive. Uh, Mars 
it's, it's going to be difficult. It is going to be difficult. And, there, and there's actually one last aspect here that people are really starting to realize the importance of, and that is eating. And it's actually the social aspects of eating. And we explore this a little bit more in some of the psychological aspects we're talking about, but NASA has really realized that there's actually value to people eating together and cooking. You know, we have all gone through lockdown recently. Uh, everyone wanted to go out and eat and have fun. If you're just going to get this can of food and you just have to sit in your corner on Mars every day and eating it, they actually start to realize that takes a toll on the human. Yeah, I mean, certainly in our family, the maybe the only time in the day we're all guaranteed <laughs> to be in the same place is the evening meal. Um, and uh, well, you suppose you could do something else. You could all be morning coffee, you all get together again. Growing coffee might be very important on these places. <laughs> so, you know, there's another subtle, there's only subtle aspects to just the food, as you said, even coffee, tea, you know, these are the luxuries. What is the bare essential? What are the luxuries? Because again, if people are going to be living here for 10 years, they're going to probably want the life that they envision, not this very rugged life that Mars may be beholding them. 